Hi, this is Miles Marie, the Soldier of Mary. Today I want to look at Malachi Martin and how we can explain the existence of two Malachi Martins. Okay, so this isn't going to be a kind of theory that Malachi Martin was killed or replaced by another version because, you know, if that was the case, we would be talking of a heretical Malachi Martin being replaced by a sound traditional Malachi Martin. And that's not normally how this whole game works because, you know, we think of agents of the New World Order wanting to bring in someone heretical, not to bring in someone super sound, super traditional. I want to look at really he, his biography because there is a real juncture between the two Malachi Martins, two points of his career. And I need to look at this, I need to explore this because one argument goes that Malachi Martin followed the dollar and his true colours are represented by his earlier writings. And then when he realised that the earlier writings were not that successful, he kind of experimented in in novels about sensational conspiracy and money began to come his way and so he decided oh, I'll take on that persona and I will be I will be that traditional Catholic that seems to this people seem to like that my books are selling now and this is the persona I'm going to be this is how I'm going to find my way in the world and this view is supported by people that knew Malachi, or some people that knew him, because a couple of first-hand eyewitnesses who I have met who themselves knew Malachi Martin were of the opinion that he was a bit of a storyteller, a bit of a storyteller who enjoyed people's attention, enjoyed people's company, and like to be the center of attention with an interesting, fascinating story. Okay, so maybe you don't believe or aren't aware of exactly what the juncture is like between the two Malachi Martins. So I'm going to read out a section from his book, Jesus Now. Jesus Now is a book that he wrote, I suppose, as a popular book of theology. And in this book, we get his take his views on who Christ is and how we can understand Christ as intelligent uh, people in the 21st century. He has written this book after he's left the Jesuits. He's left the biblical university in Rome and has come to the USA and has written this, what he wants to be a popular piece of theology. Because back in those days, back in the late 60s, early 70s, people read and even books in theology could get quite a large audience. So you can actually read this for yourself on the Internet Archive. I have put on your screen now a link to getting hold of a copy of this book, Jesus Now, which you can read freely on the Internet. I'm just going to read a couple of pages because these pages really show exactly how strange the views of Malachi Martin were at this point in his life. So here we go. In the present in the present terminal stage of the Jesus figures, we are witnessing a situation among men and women within countries and among individual countries and races in which power of all kinds, corporate, economic, military, monetary, political, educational, is increasingly gargantuanly, but without any moral basis, either operative or even acknowledged. Any moral basis for human living and human action in the West was formerly gridded on the archetypal figures of Jesus. These figures are now proven inept, and the moral basis of power and of living they facilitated is eroded. Men cannot any longer agree even as to what the word moral means. In the practical politics of living today, the question is never, is this good or bad? It is, does this increase or decrease my power, your power, our power, their power? The figures of Jesus, the worship they inspired, and the moral basis they authorised have lost applicability in ordinary human lives. I'm going to move to the next page now.
With the fragmentation and disappearance of the Jesus figures, the Jesus self has no longer any convenient vehicles for our minds. Words, therefore, fail us. Faith is papered over with shibboleths. There are no referent images or figures valid for us, by which our ideal could be known mentally and verbally as living. Images have become things, things or objects. They are no longer transparencies, through which we see deep within us the truth that is imaged for our minds. Something substantive, it seems to us, has been withdrawn. Some common persuasion that love stands behind all human things. The man is somehow in God's image, without a living ideal. The human self feels lost. Yet, within the optic of the Jesus self, nothing more merciful could have happened to that former individual self and its self-made brittle ideal. For that provided men with many reasons for wanting to die, but no major and universally felt reason for living. The old ideal itself is skeletal, desiccated, fading, as impressive as bare bones clanking in the passing winds of time and desperate minds in revolt have already picked away at any substance clinging to it. The Jesus self, however, is spirit, the height, the depth, the breadth of love itself, adhering to man and his human universe, a strange universal concept for our modern minds, which often confuse love with benevolence and spirit with what is called the irrational. Here is love, not merely a loving person, spirit, not simply a spirit, and the Jesus self is not a straw, thrown to a drowning man, nor something tacked on to a miserable fate in order to make it bearable. It is personal and constitutional to each one of us. It infuses the history and the society of humans. It tells us that we never really wish to die, to be nothing, maybe to be at rest, but not to die. And after that, to know how all our going and coming could take place in spirit and in love, not in view merely of our past and burden with the totally simply of the, our human experience. This book is a journey through the quagmire of distortions, deformations and illusions piled around our view of Jesus. It is a journey that continues through a society drawn in painful and constricted lines, where in reaction to the sham and the grossness accumulated in Jesus' name, Men and women attempted a vision of themselves and their society that excludes Jesus of Nazareth, and so excludes the Jesus self, each of us inexorably is. If that were the end of our journey, we would merely have arrived at the land of nowhere, a planet of banality, but the end is to arrive at the word, the Jesus self, Jesus, he who did not come in order to depart and need not come again, because he never went away. Jesus past, Jesus future, Jesus now. Okay, so I know that's just an extract from the preface. I have skimmed through a lot of the book, and the entire book is basically is an interesting concept. It's kind of saying that, like, the Jesus spirit is in us, that the Jesus spirit is pregnant in the universe, and that these things that we saw on the, the first page there, the Buddha self, the Jewish self, the Roman self, the Muslim self, to name a few, uh, the Christian self, all these things were efforts at tapping into the Jesus self, the Jesus self, this universal idea, which is kind of a bit cut off from the historical Jesus, uh, but the historical Jesus is a reflection of this. Basically, we're looking at a kind of Teilhard de Chardin version of Christ. And in fact, in the in the book's dedication, it mentions Teilhard de Chardin as a, as a key influence on this book and that, that Malachi Martin exchanged quite a lot with this figure. So essentially, we have a uh, Teilhard de Chardin view of Christ uh, as transcending all versions of Christ. Um, a human archetype, something deep within us, but rather cut off from the historic and dogmatic truths of the Catholic faith. Something that Ma Malachi obviously believed, as many people did, was more meaningful, more beautiful, and something that touched uh, modern man in a way that the old uh, versions did not. So this is Malachi Martin in the early 70s, just after he's left the Vatican and left the priesthood or practice of the priesthood. And then we all know, or maybe you know, 
the Malachi that comes later, the Malachi that talks of all the exorcisms that he's performed, the Malachi that tells us of the plots of the Freemasons of the New World Order, the Malachi that tells us of the importance of the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart, the Malachi that tells us of the evils of Medjugorje, the truth of Garabandal, of the battle going on within the Vatican that will continue, uh, the Malachi that appears on Art Bell on the late night shows, the Malachi that we've probably all spent hours listening to and, and enjoying. How do, we, how do we reconcile the two? Well, like I said, maybe they're not reconcilable. That's what I said at the beginning. Maybe we're dealing with an Irish storyteller who finds his niche. Another view uh, that is in an article in the Latin Mass magazine, uh, the UK magazine that's called Mass of Ages. It was an article back um, in the summer of 2021. Uh, you'll see it on the screen here. A really nice article by Mary O'Regan. Her article presents a different view of the same data and I'm going to read through that for us now. Malachi Martin was born in Kerry in 1921. July the 23rd marks the 100th year anniversary of his birth. Martin trained as a Jesuit in the old Catholic island and later described the rigours of his seminary days. When he arrived, they consecrated Hare Jail and Cologne and taught him to obey without question. A first class scholar, he became fluent in eight languages and was an expert in Semitic handwriting from the time of Abraham. In his 30s, he became a professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute and acted as Cardinal Augustine Baer's private secretary, a role he held for six years from 1958 to 1964. During this heady time, Martin said he read the Third Secret of Fatima and came to know the major players who orchestrated the changes which ravaged Mother Church. In an interview with Bernard Jansen, Martin revealed a telling incident when, during the Vatican Council, Cardinal Bear came to Martin's room in some distress. Bear had just heard Hans Kung saying that unlike the Protestant rebels of old, he and his cohorts were going to stay inside the church and change it from within. Martin never shared his reaction to Cardinal Bear's distress, yet the mere fact that he was Bear's close confidant is itself troubling, because Bear was an influential ecumenist, and in the encounter with Kung, Bear had realised his folly in accommodating Protestantism. Now, how now he was horrified when he saw that his desire to be accommodating was going to be used to make his own Catholicism unrecognisable from the time of the council. Martin and Bayer parted ways, and in the mid-60s, Martin left the Jesuits and went to America. In the coming decades, he gave the impression that he had always been an arch-traditionalist. He became a celebrated author and defended the traditional Latin mass. There is, however a gap in understanding of Martin's development as a traditional Catholic. Martin's past is so mysterious that there was a time when I thought that they were two separate authors who, with the same name, because I could not fathom how Martin had written Jesus Now in 1973 and Hostage to the Devil in 1976. I thought they must be two separate people, but no, it was the same Martin who wrote both books. In Jesus Now, Martin is adamant there will be no second coming of Christ, and he brags about his closeness to Pierre Delard de Chardon, a man whose books contain, according to the church, grave doctrinal errors. Yet three years after Jesus Now hit the shelves, Martin published Hostage to the Devil, which has a section where he refutes de Chardon. My contention is that Martin had a conversation, had a, sorry, a conversion, between Jesus now and hostage to the devil, and changed from being an admirer to Taylor de Chardon to being his arch critic. I believe he wrote himself into hostage to the devil as Father David, a professor of paleontology who has allowed himself to be influenced by de Chardon's constructs of Christ, and who must submit to an exorcism before he can himself perform exorcisms. Father David must free himself from de Chardon and thus Satan's influence. He learns that his exception of de Chardon's dangerous reduction of the past person of Christ means he does not have sufficient faith to call on the power of Christ to exorcise a young priest. The first time Father David tries to exorcise the priest, the demon speaking through the young priest taunts him. You have adopted the, li the Lord of Light, like I have, you old fool. Physician, cure yourself. When Father David is at a, at a lost how to continue the exorcism, the demon mocks him. And you were trying to exorcise me. Only after Father David rejects de Chardon's heretical teaching that Christ is merely the pinnacle of man's evolution, can he successfully perform the right of exorcism. 
To cast Christ as the Omega point, who is the best creation of evolutionary process, is still to emphasize his humanity over his divinity. And in some ways, this is the most deadly for a priest, because it is all too easy for a priest to see himself as a man like Christ, but just lower down the scale, when in fact the priest has to invoke Christ's authority as savior of all men in order to expel a demon. If Martin was really writing about himself, he employed some heavy disguise, but as in Father David's case, it would appear that Malachi Martin was cleansed of his infatuation with de Chardon. Whatever these controversies, I'm a big, I'm a fan of Martin. Perhaps his own conversion came about through battles with the demonic, battles that finally convinced him of the divinity of Christ as Lord of Lords, who has dominion over all. So, I really like that article, and I hope that uh, if you're not a subscriber to the Latin Mass, Mass of Ages magazine, you might consider it. It's one of the best uh, Catholic magazines that I know of. This article um, really provides an interesting reconciliation of the two Malachi Martins, that he had a conversion at this point in his career, between 73 and 76, it's certainly a good explanation and it's an explanation that allows us to embrace Malachi Martin's uh, material and his books and not have to see him as this Irish storyteller charlatan figure that is slightly dubious. You know, it, it's a good explanation, but I'm still not 100% sure because even past his so-called conversion, I wonder if he slips a few times. For instance, and I've mentioned this before, I think, there's a, in the video Hostage to the Devil, the Netflix documentary, we see a clip of Malachi Martin where he's just given a talk to a whole crowd of people and then he tells everyone at the end of the talk, oh, and now I'm going to give you a blessing with the pics containing the blessed sacrament that I always carry with me and he gives them a blessing with the pics. For me that is anathema that a priest would carry the blessed sacrament around him and come to a talk where they're having a social afterwards and give a blessing only revealing at the end of the talk that he's carrying our blessed Lord and Saviour. No way. That raises serious questions to me about the authenticity of Martin, even after his conversion. But maybe maybe I'm being too harsh. We're not saying that he's become a saint. We're merely saying he's become traditional and he's left behind his uh, Tilard de Chardon heresies. And maybe, maybe it's perfectly possible for him to be a traditionalist Catholic priest, but not be all with it. You know, I suppose none of us are completely with it and we make mistakes and we repent. I really like this article and I think it goes some way in explaining the two Malachi Martins. Let me know what you think. May Almighty God bless you. May Our Lady intercede for you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.